Take Command is a new book released by Dale Carnegie. The book features leadership stories from our podcast guests, as well as young up-and-coming professionals. Published by Simon & Schuster, Take Command is co-authored by Joe Hart and Michael Crom. Visit TakeCommand.com for more details and to buy the book. Now to our latest episode. Welcome to Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast, the show where we seek to uncover what leadership means in today's world. I'm Joe Hart, CEO of Dale Carnegie, and we will be talking to diverse leaders with stories to tell across various industries to help unlock your potential for success. We will be sharing real life insights into leadership, which in turn can help spark the next level of your growth as a leader. Our guest today is a veteran of the technology industry an inventor and visionary whose work has helped some of the most sought after technology products successfully enter the market. In 2003, he filed a patent for the first video doorbell, now known as Ring. He is once again revolutionizing the industry with this latest first generation technology that addresses security in the fast growing e-commerce sector, using mobile applications for improved security, access and logistics. Due to his tremendous technological contributions, he became a member of the Forbes Technology Council, an invitation-only organization of high-level technology leaders with deep knowledge and diverse experience in the industry. Please welcome the founder and CEO of One Ahead, Ron Carter. Ron, great to have you here. Welcome to the Dale Carnegie Take Command podcast. Oh, thank you for having me, Joe. It's great to see you. I've really been looking forward to talking with you because you are an inventor extraordinaire. I know that you have multiple patents, including the patent on, I believe, the ring doorbell. You've got some really great things, and there's so much involved in taking an idea and commercializing it and making reality. Definitely want to talk about that. Take us a little bit back, Ron. Tell us a little bit about you, about how you got started, about your background. I mean, were you inventing as a child or where did this love of inventing come from? Well, Joe, I've always had a curiosity about things and would explore things and learned at an early age that I had a pretty high IQ, but I never really understood what that meant. I didn't realize that I was that creative until my career with city government. I'm a military brat, Joe. My parents were both military and we traveled pretty frequently. I call home, North Carolina, a town called Fayetteville, North Carolina, where my dad uh, was stationed. And I spent most of my time in high school and um, there until my parents were deceased. North Carolina primarily has been my home. And you were talking about city government. You started your career and spent much of your career in city government. And how did that lead to an inventing career? Well, that's a great question, Joe. I uh, worked in community development in three different cities, starting out in Fayetteville and then going to Greensboro. And Winston-Salem recruited me from Greensboro. And ultimately, Charlotte, which was my last destination, recruited me from Winston-Salem. My job was developing at-risk communities. Years ago, we called it urban renewal. The modern day term is community development, where you go in and you rebuild threatened neighborhoods, which I did pretty successfully. When I was in Winston-Salem, the Department of Housing and Urban Development recognized how successful I have been in developing communities and came to Winston-Salem and asked me if I would train the nation through this program called Frank, P-H-R-A-N-C, which stood for Professional Housing Rehab Association of North Carolina. If I would train other municipalities to do what I was doing to accomplish the number of houses I was developing. At the time, I didn't realize it was creativity. It was just doing what just came natural for me. And I'll be honest with you, Joe, I've always seen things a little bit differently from everybody else. Working in city government, when the national average was about 75 houses a year, I was doing over 300 houses a year, three years consecutively. I mean, that's incredible. So the, the national average is 75. You're doing 300, right? You're quadrupling that. And it goes back to, you said, was that because you said, you know, you have a way of seeing things? What were you doing differently? Or how are you looking at the problem, so to speak, that was enabling you to have those kinds of results? Sure. 
housing and urban development or the federal government provide funding to all cities, municipalities primarily, to develop infrastructure and to secure stable housing. I saw a way of taking those dollars and leveraging them through a loan program to invest to builders and investors. And I structured it so that the more money that the investor put in, the lesser the interest rate on our side for our input. And everyone loved it. I had absentee investors coming from all over the country back to rental properties that they own and wanting to participate And just by leveraging the interest rate based on their amount of investment was very successful. Rather than just spending every dime of the federal government's money, the money went a lot further when I got investors to participate and receive funding at a very low interest rate. I mean, it's just interesting how the way that you saw it, a simple change makes a huge difference, right? I mean, you could have 10 people looking at the same problem and one person looks at it a little bit differently and gets the kind of results that you were able to get. I'd like to dig a little bit deeper because what can we learn from your experience? I mean, we all aspire to be creative and innovative. What advice might you have for people who are looking at problems the way that you were looking at that problem? Sure. I would say just trust your instincts. We all are gifted differently. And if it doesn't appear to fit within the norm, don't dispel it. Just trust your instincts and be brave enough to follow through. A lot of times we get shut down because it doesn't fall within a specific parameter or a mindset that we determine to be the norm. I've not ever been limited by those things. I'm willing to kind of pursue my thoughts and ideas. And fortunately, they turned out okay. You said the (laughs) word brave. And there is a certain amount of bravery that's required, right, to do the types of things you're talking about. Have you always had that inner bravery? Where have you found kind of the confidence to move forward when other people might have had different views or said, Ron, that's not going to work? How did you draw on that in yourself? As with anything, Joe, It's a matter of success and failure. Bravery doesn't necessarily guarantee success, but when you fail, you've got to understand that that's normal. That doesn't mean that you, you know, hide your talents or not try again. And so fortunately for me, success more often than failure has driven me to trust my mindset, my way of thinking, and my ideas. I still have that issue today. I'll go against my board of directors in a heartbeat. I can have five board of directors see things one way, and ultimately at the end, they go, oh, wow, how did you come up with that? You know, none of us would have never thought of it that way. So trust the talents that God has given each of us. Certainly, you're going to fail for some time, but if you really believe strong enough in what you're wanting to pursue, go after it, because I found that it's destiny in most cases. It's your destiny. It's incredible because sometimes we're afraid to trust our instincts. It's taken me years to really get comfortable trusting my gut. You know, you doubt it and so forth. But as I've gotten older, it's gotten easier. Has that been the case for you too? Or have you just always trusted your gut? It's gotten a lot easier. (laughs) It's gotten a lot easier, you know, because sometimes failure comes with consequences. And so given where you are in your life, You know, whether it's on a job where, you know, the consequences could be very detrimental. It has a lot to do with that. But I'm at a point now where most folks just trust me because of my track record of success. So let me ask you about that. So you're in city government. You're doing really well. How did you get from that to (laughs) then, I think, around 2004-ish, you left, you got these patents, and you were one of the innovators around you know, video-based technologies. You got the patent for a video doorbell, the one that was in ring. How did that happen? In 2003, 2004, we were nowhere near having the ability to stream video. At that time, everything was considered closed circuit where video content was either transmitted via a antenna or a wire. And so... That's one of the reasons I received the patent is because I was so far ahead of the technology. So what transpired is in 2004, my mom had two hip surgeries. She came home and probably several months later was the holidays, Thanksgiving. And I I went home and I didn't have my key and I rang the doorbell and I got worried. She couldn't make it to the door. And when she finally made it to the door, she was perspiring. And I'm like, wow, you know, I'm sorry, I forgot my key. 
And so I rigged up a BlackBerry phone and a Panasonic camera. I said, maybe this will work and you can see who's at the door before you leave. Well, it worked, but it just took a day and a half for the picture to come in. <laughs> so, so I knew that it was just a matter of time. And that's the only reason that I have that patent is that I created it so far ahead of the ability to stream, which technically is called 802.11g. You know, it just happened so far ahead. Necessity is the mother of invention or something to that effect. So in an effort to create something that would save my mom the energy and the steps of getting to the door, it led to what we now know as Ring. The ability to stream didn't happen until 2009, 2010. So really the technology sat kind of dormant for about five or six years until we were able to stream. But once it occurred, it is what it is. I mean, it's pretty incredible what you did. I mean, I haven't heard anything in our conversation about a technology background. How did you do that? Or was it just something that you had? It was a background or a hobby or? In Charlotte, there's a company called Inventus. And one of the things I don't want to deter anyone from pursuing any ideas, but there are a lot of predator companies in the space that ask for your invention. I was fortunate enough to find one where everything was located under one roof, a lot of accountability. And I had the idea on a napkin and I said, look, here's a BlackBerry phone. It transmits data. It will communicate with this Panasonic camera. Let's make this work. The first actual prototype was developed at this company called Inventus Partners in Charlotte, North Carolina. Over the course of two years, we developed a prototype that, as I mentioned, was functional. It just took forever because the download capability was so slow. We knew it was just a matter of time. And that's where it began. Shortly after that, around 2011, it was commonplace. And as you know, I lost my company. I'm sure you've done the research. Uh, I lost my original company, unfortunately, which uh, was really a springboard to where I am now. Could, could you tell us a little bit about that, that experience? Yeah, it was kind of devastating, not really the best of times. I brought an individual into the company that I was told could help with investor relations. Very, very smart gentleman. However, over a period of a couple of years, through some transactions that he suggested, such as buying a finance company, which we purchased, and uh, some other things that he had going on behind the scenes, he took control of the company. <laughs> I didn't find out until um, 2016 when the SEC came in and indicted this guy. And we found out that the finance company that we purchased, he owned, never disclosed it. And so we purchased it for a tremendous number of shares. And with what he'd already had legitimately, that purchase put him in a controlling position. And so he took over the company in 2017. I mean, that must have been, you used the word, I think, devastating. So Ron, coming out of that experience where, you know, you trusted someone that let you down, that caused you ultimately to lose the company, you must have had regret or looking back and saying, I wish I'd done this and so forth. And we know that many times people will just beat themselves up over the things that they did or didn't do and so forth. Was that a factor at all for you? And if so, how did you overcome that? Well, unfortunately, there's a element that exists in nature that's not always clean, that's evil, and there's no way around that. I learned not to be as trusting. I accepted it. To be totally honest with you, my faith and trust have proven that perhaps it was not my time. I often tell folks, Amazon purchased Ring for $1.6 billion. Amazon could have purchased my company and got everybody, not just Ring. And so the person that took over my company was so short-sighted and so greedy that missed a tremendous opportunity for everyone, not just himself. The investors, everyone could have done extremely well had Amazon purchased my company as opposed to purchasing Ring. 
Amazon, as I mentioned, would have got Ring, ADT, CPI, Livewire, got everybody because all of those companies licensed my technology, just, just not just Ring. So, uh, Joe, personally, I receive it as it was a lesson and I wasn't ready. Yet. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Success may have not been right for me at that particular time. I was not as settled at that point in my life as I am now. Wealth may have damaged me. So the fact that now I have a new technology that's going to retire all of these video doorbells, but I want you to include that because that's my vengeance. Now our technology could retail for about $9.99 because of all the features there. We're intentionally bringing it online between $369 and $399 for the sole purpose of retiring all of the video doorbells to take control of that whole sector. That brings me so much pleasure <laughs> to be able to do that. I think I'm in a better state of mind and time in my life where success will not ruin me. It would actually go to support many things. If I have my health, I have everything. I'm pleased with where God has me now. I see it as a blessing. So it's perspective. To answer your question, regret is a matter of perspective. Things are going to happen. It's how you respond to those things that happen, how you receive it. And I received it as, in my case, you know, evil will exist. I got taken. I will rebound and I have rebounded. That's phenomenally insightful. And thank you for sharing that. It's powerful because, you know, we all have things in our lives that we face that are challenging. Sometimes we have major setbacks. Sometimes we blame ourselves. We get ourselves in a very, very bad place. And when we have the right perspective, as you talked about, which is partly acceptance, it was your faith, it was the belief, it was the mindset that said, you know what, I believe something better is going to come out of this. Sounds like that really helped you get through that tough time. And I'm super excited for you for the future. Thank you, Joe. This technology has so many verticals. It's just so exciting to watch it materialize. Our focus has been on residential and finding out there's a commercial application, government applications that are being pursued. It's just pretty amazing. Thank you for sharing that and for being vulnerable with that story, because I think a lot of people would look at you and the success that you've had, or they look at successful people and they see it as linear, like they don't <laughs> see the setbacks. But we all have setbacks. And you certainly, that must have been a major setback. So how did you overcome that? You were crushed. You'd started this company. It was your baby, your intellectual property. How did you move forward? My faith, number one. I had responsibilities that I had to make sure I continued to meet, such as my household responsibility. So immediately after that, it happened in November of 2017. Just happened to be around the holidays and UPS was hiring. So... The first job that I could find was on a UPS truck during the holidays, delivering Christmas packages and so forth. Little did I know at the time that that was the beginning of where we are today with this new technology. I discovered that e-commerce was an exploding, it was literally a economic turbine. People were shopping online in 2017 like crazy and we began to hear about porch party, and I'm like, wow. So when I did the research, I learned that that's a $5 trillion industry as compared to an $80 billion industry, which is the security industry, that e-commerce was literally an opportunity to provide security over and above what we consider personal and physical security. And so after two years of working with UPS, this is the part where I really want to share the spiritual. I'm a cancer survivor, by the way. Uh, that's important that I share that. And I want to share that during that period of my life when I was afraid of dying with cancer, I uh, would lay in the bed and pray at night. And um, this one particular night at three o'clock in the morning, I heard this voice that said, you don't know me. And it scared me. It was like nothing I'd heard before, and my wife's the minister, so I shook her, and I said, did you hear that? Somebody's in here. She said, no, you're just dreaming. I said, no, you sure you didn't hear that? I said, I just heard you don't know me. I think God said you don't know me. 
And she said, well, just lay down and go back to sleep and be glad he didn't say he don't know you, you know. <laughs> so, Joe, I laid back down, and that's when God began to tell me, he says, you know, so many people think they have a relationship with me, and they have a relationship with church. They don't know me at all. And he said, you're one of those people. So anyway, a couple of days later, I had this dream of this new technology with AI, and I knew God was telling me to do it again. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm just too old. I just don't have it in me. I don't, you know, I just don't want to do anything else again like that. It was like they laid out every feature of this new technology, the AI component. And I remember saying, okay, I'll consider it if you show me everything. Well, that dream ended. And the next night it picked back up right where it left off. And it was just like a blueprint. And so uh, the next day I went to a friend of mine and I asked him to loan me $5,000. And I said, I don't know if I'll be able to pay you back, but I think I have something that will be pretty big. And I said, just trust me. And he loaned me the $5,000 and I went to a patent examiner and we filed a patent. And um, we filed in November of 2018. And then in January of 2020, the patent office called me and said, we just got notice of allowance. And I said, for what? They said, for your patent. And I said, no, it's not even been 14, 15 months. I said, how could it be? The patent attorney said, I don't know. I've never seen anything like it. This is unheard of. I said, are you sure? He says, yeah, it just came. So that was confirmation for me, Joe. When the examiner came back in about 14 months, we got notice of allowance for this AI technology and it was like, oh, happy day for me. I just shouted and danced because at that point, I understood the value of having artificial intelligence at an entry point. It's an incredible story. If we go back and you look at it, sometimes you can see kind of the breadcrumbs or the way that dots connect. You go back and you had this devastating experience and then you work at UPS, you see something, you have an insight, and then you have this experience with your dream and with God, where all of a sudden everything's laid out and you get your patent. I'm a lawyer by background. I know a little bit about patents. I know that that is incredibly fast to be able to get a patent, but the way everything came together and now you have this technology, it was really fun kind of learning about the technology. I know you're getting ready to take it to market now. This isn't just a ring doorbell. This is something that can interact with the person who comes to the door. I can ask, you know, how can I can help you and actually interact with the person as I understand it. And if it's a delivery person, they can scan the package. You can unlock a lockbox so they can put it securely in your property. And I think you've actually got a feature here too. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you've got the ability for a drone to chase away a thief or something. Am I understanding all this correctly? <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. Let me add just, and I'll go right into that. Anytime you approach an opportunity, if your focus is on you know, how much money you can make, how successful financially you can be, you're off to a bad start. Your focus and my focus has always been primarily on the success or whatever happens after that, so be it. But my focus has already always been on how can I make this happen, not on how much money can I make. So we've never had security, Joe, ever. What we've had is a system of bells and whistles and alarms that started out with this group called Central Station Alarm, that something was triggered, a breach of your privacy or whatever was triggered, it set off an alarm, which originally went directly to the police department. And they would dispatch a car to come to that site, that location. And that became such a burden on municipalities because of the number of false alarms that they began to create monitoring stations that would then confirm the event and send it to the police. Well, that whole scenario is pretty ridiculous. Because criminals know they have so much time to get in and out of your home to do what they need to do and, and be gone. That's essentially what we've had for years, this system of bells and whistles. The ring, for instance, was not designed for security. I didn't create that. I created that for convenience. So you could see who was at the door and decide whether or not to open it. Back in 2003, we didn't have mail order delivery like we have it now. But the industry has convinced the consumer with the transition of 
the need for security that that video doorbell can provide a security application and it can. Literally, all it can do is let you describe who walk away with your package. It doesn't mitigate a threat at all. And so we have technology that can, for a first time in history, literally mitigate a threat. And that's what we have patented. In fact, you know, I'm really proud of our IP portfolio. Our IP portfolio now is ahead of companies that have been around for 10, 15 years because our focus is more relevant and relative to the time we were in. We started out with the focus on e-commerce. That was it. How do we support e-commerce? A $6 trillion industry that's losing almost $15 million in packages a day. How do we support this industry? And once we accomplished that, Joe, we were satisfied. There's a patent out there owned by a major company that claims everything. I mean, the kitchen sink and you name it. And the patent office rejects just about anything coming through now because of this massive patent. And so we were able to convince the examiner that we have a security solution that's networkable. It's not isolated to a controller. Like in your home, you have a command station or control that you put a code in and no one knows that code but you. All security everywhere is based on something similar, maybe even you know at a bigger magnitude, but still there's some central station, there's some central point where that device manages security access and, and so forth. Well, our solution is networkable, which means that we can share security access with anyone that has the application in the next five or 10 years, we won't have metal keys anymore because our solution with a reader and images is more secure than a key ring full of metal keys. Once we convinced the examiner that this solution was a networkable solution, as opposed to one that was tied to a central station or a central controller, the examiner got excited. And he began to like, wow, I get it, I get it, I get it. So we just decided one day, let's see if we can add robots and drones to this thing, see if he approves it. And sure enough, he approved it. That's when everything changed because it took what we had as a security device. And now it's a whole home security platform where we can not only support packages and deliveries, but we can actually provide personal and home security in a way that has never been done before. That was pretty exciting. It's pretty cool. I want to get back and talk to you about leadership, but if someone wants to buy one of these, how do they do that? Is it available yet? Is it pre-order? You know, we were going to launch through Kickstarter, but I wasn't comfortable because of the complexity of the technology. I discovered it's going to take just probably a year to maybe 14 months to develop. As of right now, we're looking for opportunities to to manufacture as quickly as possible, ideally within a year. So it's probably still about a year out. You've got a website though, right? Is there a website that people can check at? Sure. I'm excited about the product website, which is glow, G-L-O dash AI.com. And then the company's website is the number one ahead technologies.com. That's one A-H-E-A-D technologies.com. Okay. Well, sounds good. Well, people will know where to look. I'm intrigued by this. <clears throat> sounds really, really innovative. Let's go back to this idea of creativity and innovation, because you know one of the things we teach in Dale Carnegie is around an innovation process, but you may have creative people. You can have a great idea. If you don't have the right process, if you don't have the right interpersonal skills, you can't ultimately take that idea and make that real. What are some things that you've learned along the way of inventing these kinds of products around interacting with other people? How have you gotten people excited about your ideas? How have you interacted with people? How have you dealt with people who said, that's a bad idea, but you've kept going anyway? Each of us have that creative capability. I have an amazing team. And it's the energy that originates from the creator that really sells the idea, the concept. It's never been difficult for me to get people excited about an idea once I've 
kind of locked in on it. I'm interested in how we can make this a success. Are you willing to participate and help make this a success? That's been my approach. Because after losing my first company and the investors that were involved, we all lost. Coming back with another product and securing investment was twice as hard. It was not easy, but people understood when that occurred that it was a loss that I lost more than anyone else. And support came from a position of not that we lost our money, but we know what happened to you and we're still willing to back you again because we believe in you. And that was so inspiring to me that the same people who had lost on the first go round came back and said, Ron, because of who you are and we know what happened, we got your back and we're ready to stand behind you with investments. That was amazing because when I said no, when the idea came to me in the middle of the night and I said no, I was thinking about how I let down so many people who had invested the first time. And that must have been just so gratifying. I mean, to have those people believe in you the way that they did. How would you define leadership, Ron? What does leadership mean to you? If you were to define it in a sentence or two. Recognizing the ability of others before yourself. I've never accomplished anything independently. Even when I worked in city government, I looked for the best in everyone and made them feel that their contribution had value. And their contribution was a contribution to a team effort and not so much me dictating this is how things should go or it was collaborative. And when you have people who are committed to a solution, it's much stronger than anything any leader can offer. In fact, the leader should only be a director. Everyone on my team, they realize their value. Most leaders don't know it all. They can't know it all. To pretend or to present yourself as someone that you know knows it all, do it this way, and there's no other way to do it, I think sets himself up for failure. So I've always had the approach of a team approach. It's foolish for one of us, any one of us, to think with arrogance that we have all the answers. I've learned, especially over the years, just how important it is to listen to the people. I can't think of a time that if I've had an idea that you start talking to people, that they haven't either made it a better idea or it wasn't a great idea, but it's a myth of leadership. Sometimes, especially young leaders think that, well, I have to know everything. And if I don't know something, it makes me look bad, but we don't have all the answers, right? That's right. I often say I'm the dimmest bulb at the table. And that creates a sense of ownership and everyone else around the table to help me be brighter. And it works. It works not just from a strategic standpoint. It's an effective measure of leadership to trust and engage those around you for the support that they can provide you. Oh, it's great advice, Ron. Well, thank you so much. Great discussion. Any closing pieces of wisdom for our audience? Just trust your instincts. Be true to yourself. Certainly integrity means so, so, so much because without that, you won't get anywhere. And don't focus on how wealthy or how rich you can become. Focus on how successful you can become. That would be my advice. Awesome. Well, again, thank you, Ron, so much for being with me today. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful, John. Thanks. In today's Thought Leadership Spotlight segment, our guest reveals how to talk to your team and understand the individual. He emphasizes the importance of leveraging the strengths of each team member to promote both individual and team growth, ultimately leading to success. Like Ron Carter, our guest reminds us to be brave and to follow through with a positive mindset. Please welcome the president and CEO of Dale Carnegie Central and Eastern North Carolina, Neville DeLucia. It's a Saturday morning, it's early. We're reviewing our business performance and I'm feeling quite anxious because we're not quite where we wanna be in our business. And Ken says to me, Neville, the pipeline might be looking good, but we can't feed the family on that pipeline. Sales solves all problems. And you know what? She's right. I had this doubt. And I remember the words of what Ron Carter said. Now, be brave and follow through. We have to have a positive mindset. But what he also says was, failing is normal. We mustn't let it hide our talents or stop us from trying again. I know my strengths as a visionary leader 
needs people, enablers in the business. So we looked at our business plan and said, we're doing the right things. We're investing in enablers. We also realized that we have strengths that our team members don't have, and they have strengths that I don't have. How can we leverage the strength of one another to grow? We took that to our leadership team, and in an open, robust dialogue, we spoke about what we can do, where we're doing, how can we be more effective as a team? We started seeing the change. We started finding that our public programs are filling up more. Our pipeline is growing even more and more. So what's happening is we're being successful because we're openly communicating and leveraging the strengths of the team. Speak with your team and understand the individual. And if you do that, we'll leverage their strengths and we'll grow and find success. Join us and order a copy of Take Command in hardcover, ebook, or audiobook format at your favorite bookseller or at takecommandbook.io. Also, you can visit takecommand.com for more information about the book and additional resources. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast. Check out our resources page at www.dalecarnegie.com for more research, insight, and tools that will support your success in taking command of your leadership potential. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating it and subscribing to us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. As always, thank you for listening, and we look forward to you joining us for the next episode of Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast.